For 128 years, Britain ruled this obscure corner of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, one of the few signs left of the British presence is this bizarre scrapyard of weapons, a reminder of the most chaotic closing chapter in the entire history of the end of the empire. Near the wrecks stands a military cemetery. The men buried here died in the withdrawal from a colony Britain wanted to leave at any price. In the 60s, these narrow streets were the scene of a bloody civil war. Twenty years after India gained her independence, Britain was trapped in a war over a colony she had already promised to leave. Soldiers were fighting and getting killed for no reason anyone in Britain could understand. I don't believe uh, that we need necessarily have left Aden in the way we did. In, in almost every other case, every other colony we left, the bands played Will You Know Come Back Again and there was a great deal of uh, tear jerking and in some instances um, a lot of people uh, regretted the fact that we'd gone. But we left Aden rather like thieves in the night. Queen Victoria was left behind. Today she rests at the back of a museum. In 1839, this colony became the first imperial acquisition of her reign. Aden was a fishing village when Captain Haynes of the Indian Navy landed here and defeated the local sultan. This superb natural harbour was at first thought vital to safeguard the route to India. After the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, Aden started to prosper. Aden was at the center of the British colonial trading system. Ships stopped here for fuel en route between Europe and India, the Far East and Australia. It was still a loyal imperial outpost in 1953 when the newly crowned Queen Elizabeth paid a visit on her world tour. Soon after coming ashore, the Queen took the salute and marched past. The bearing and discipline of every unit parading on this proud occasion was most impressive. The Arab people, many children among them, were obviously eager to catch a glimpse of the Queen as she presently drove off towards the RAF hospital. The Queen's visit really was quite astonishing. Uh, I'd never expected to see um, such uh, popular jubilation and uh, all the rest of it. There was some dancing in the streets and singing, and there was not a voice raised in opposition at all. In the 50s, Aden became the busiest harbour in the world after New York. And in 1954, BP opened a huge new refinery to process oil from the Gulf. The British enjoyed the good life in the Little Raj. Pampered by Arab servants and catered for by Indian traders, they felt safe in this imperial backwater. Throughout the 1950s, as the empire was being dismantled, Aden's economy boomed. It was a duty-free mecca for the thousands of tourists off the ocean liners. Lost in time, British rule went on in the old colonial style, as if nothing had happened. Around the colony of Aden itself was a wilderness, the British protectorates, an area as large as England and Wales, occupied by feuding tribes. When Britain grabbed Aden, she had no interest in these lawless territories other than as a defensive zone.
Tribal rulers, like the Emir of Baihan, were persuaded to sign treaties of protection and to accept political advisers. The few Britons who entered this medieval world could do little to change it. I was coming down from up country and I stopped in a village. I heard a clanking noise at my feet and I looked around and I saw a kind of grill in the ground below and I could hear somebody moving about and clanking and I asked who it was and they were all very evasive, the Sheikh in particular, so I said get this chap out and they brought him out and he had a beard down to his waist and he's dressed in rags and emaciated to a degree and I asked why, how long he'd been there and nobody could remember and apparently he'd been locked away years before and there he'd been left. So I told, and he was shackled, hands and foot, and I told them to knock the shackles off and let the fellow go free. I thought he'd thank me for the good deed, but far from it, he complained that from now on nobody would give him any food. In the protectorates, around half a million people scratched a living from the barren soil. Unlike their neighbors in Saudi Arabia, the tribal rulers had no oil and practically no other source of income. Britain bought them as allies with a few rifles and a little money. This then is the Aden Protectorate. And one of the main reasons for the cessation of barbarism here is the Aden Protectorate Levies, a small but compact force formed in 1928. Few recruits can write, so an inky thumb signs them in for an initial four years. This army of Arab soldiers under British officers brought the British and the Sultans into close alliance. The colonial power also employed a more modern system. What happened was that if you had a tribe that was causing trouble, you got hold of its sheikhs and you said, well, you either do as you're told and hand in hostages to answer for your good behavior, or we're going to come and bomb you. And you gave them time to clear out of their villages or houses and get their flocks and herds out of the way. And then you went off and dropped bombs, small bombs on the whole. And it was a remarkably efficacious and cheap way of maintaining law and order in otherwise ungetatable areas. Until the 1950s, air policing subdued the warring tribesmen. But even this remote corner was about to be transformed by the nationalist revolution sweeping through the Arab world. The tribesmen were radicalized by a new voice from Cairo. Gamal Abdul Nasser became the champion of the Arab world after his triumph over Britain and France in 1956. He transmitted the anti-colonial message even to the South Arabian protectorates. Nasser turned to be a hero, a legend, uh, to hold all the Arab people. For the first time they hear uh, an, an Arab uh, leader who is challenging uh, a big uh, power, uh, insisting on the freedom of all the Arab world and on the Arab nationalism. Wherever you went in the protectorate, you could hear the Cairo radio coming out of these transistor radios. You'd find some old gentleman died in blue woad, plying his field with NASA's propaganda coming out. In, in, and the, it was almost impossible to counter. Uh, it was, uh, after all, uh, calling for freedom, freedom from uh, foreign foreigners. I didn't believe that our propaganda, such as it was, was the slightest bit of use. Cairo Radio denounced the Sultans with their British arms as enemies of the Arab Revolution. The Sultans were so worried by this propaganda that they took up a British plan to form a federation for their defense. In 1959, the Federation of South Arabia was established. Eventually, most of the rulers were to sign up. Britain built a white hall in the sand and palaces for the Sultans. 
In the new federal capital, the rulers performed a charade of parliamentary government. One of the few sultans with a formal education was their principal spokesman. We had a system which worked. And uh, we saw no reason to experiment uh, modern or Western democracy in a country uh, where it failed. It failed everywhere in the Middle East. And there was no point in trying to experiment it in our uh, country. But we had a system which, uh, which worked. And the rulers were elected by their tribal uh, leaders. And whether or not by Western concept, this may not sound democratic. But uh, according to our customs, it was democratic. The absence of elections and the autocratic ways of the sultans ensured that the British and the sultans themselves did not know the extent of nationalist feeling among the people in the protectorates. كنا نعرض الاتحاد الفدرالي لأنه صنع من صناعة الاستعمار وكنا نعرض حكومة الاتحاد لأنها مكونة من الأمراء ومن السلاطين ذلك الاتحاد الذي أقامه المستعمرين وكنا نشعر أن أجداد أولئك السلاطين وأباؤهم وهم هم الذين وقعوا مع المستعمرين الحماية in Aden, prosperity had attracted a huge influx of immigrant workers from all over South Arabia. They joined trade unions that took up the Nasserite anti-imperialist cause and opposed the Federation with strikes and demonstrations. The British colonial authorities ignored the nationalists and gave full backing to the Sultans and their Federation. I think there are two things one was trying to do. First of all, one was trying to prepare the ground for eventual independence. Because after all, it was a, a very, very backward uh, state of affairs. You had a colony and a whole lot of little protected states. And uh, at that time, obviously, we should have begun to think about eventual independence. And then later on, uh, it seemed to me that uh, we should um, uh, be able to get what we wanted, let's say what the British government at that uh, time wanted, uh, which was a friendly government with which we could uh, negotiate a treaty and uh, make whatever arrangements we wanted for use of the facilities in Aden. The main facility was a huge military base designed to restore the tottering British presence in the Middle East. Britain had been kicked out of Egypt, Iraq and Jordan. So Aden now became the headquarters of Middle East Command. In the early 1960s, thousands of British servicemen and their families settled in Aden. The British government made it clear repeatedly that the base was permanent. The nationalists in the Aden trade unions, inspired by Nasser, campaigned against this old-fashioned imperialism. But the vast majority of Adeny workers had no vote. The only way they could express their opposition to the Federation was on the streets. Their leader was Abdullah al aznag a trade unionist and nationalist who had close ties with the British Labour Party. He saw himself as a future Prime Minister. The British, indifferent to the nationalist opposition, forced Aden into the Federation, uniting the prosperous port with the backward inland protectorates. But the enlarged federation came under immediate threat. In its nearest neighbor, Yemen, army officers supported by Egypt seized power. The royalists resisted the coup. It was the start of a five-year civil war. The Egyptians eventually had 70,000 soldiers fighting on the Republican side. Nasser, once a noisy but distant threat, was now at the Federation's doorstep. For the nationalists of Aden and South Arabia, relief seemed close at hand. In 1963, with Egyptian help, the first of them began to operate as guerrillas here in the mountainous wilderness of the Radfan. They called themselves the NLF, the National Liberation Front. The NLF believed that armed revolution was the only way to independence. Their leader was Katar Nashabi, a British-trained agricultural officer. 
he had been in exile in Cairo and with Egyptian money set up headquarters in Yemen to direct the guerrilla campaign. The British, to deal with what seemed no more than a severe tribal outbreak, built an airstrip. They flew in troops and supplies. To the British Army's amazement, two battalions found themselves tied down by skilled marksmen, no longer obligingly shooting each other, but now aiming at the British. Our worst casualties happened within a few minutes uh, from a couple of snipers on the hillside behind the village. Most unfortunate, we got over the battle with four casualties, four wounded, and then we lost two men uh, to this wretched sniper and another half dozen wounded. وفي هذا المعركة أعترف الجيش الجنود البريطاني بأنهم يواجهوا ثورة منظمة ورجال مقاتلين يحكموا ضرب رصاصات بنادقم إلى أجسام الجنود البريطانيين وجعلهم بهذه المعركة ومعارك أخرى يعترفون بأن بأن ثوار الدفان هم الدأب الحمر من خلال العمليات العسكرية ومن خلال دقة الإصابات الموجهة للجنود الإنجليز. It was six months before the British army were able to conquer the key positions in the Radfan Mountains. They claimed a great success. لكن في الحقيقة أنا تمكننا من هزيمة هذه القوة البريطانية رغم إمكانياتها الهائلة تمكننا من هزيمتها وفي الأخير نحن كسبنا كسبنا الحرب وكسبنا المعركة وانتصر لنا أصحاب قضية. Radfan was the starting point for the NLF revolution, which gradually began to spread through the protectorates. Despite the growing nationalist pressure, the High Commissioner, Sir Kennedy Travaskis, and the Colonial Secretary, Duncan Sands, pressed ahead with their plan to give the federal government of the Sultans formal independence. Sands visited the Radfan to congratulate the troops. The British colonial authorities dismissed the NLF as a small band of pro-Egyptian extremists, incapable of affecting their plans for the area. In October 1964, a general election brought the Labour Party under Harold Wilson to power. The Labour Party had attacked the Federation as unrepresentative and reactionary. In opposition, it had supported al Aznag and his claim that the Aden workers had a right to vote for their own government. But in office, the Labour ministers succumbed to American pressure not to relinquish Britain's global strategic role. So the government decided that its first priority in Aden was to keep the base. It reassured the Sultans that it would stand by the Federation. In 1965, the Labour government called the Sultans and the moderate nationalists to a conference in London to try to persuade them to share power. But al Aznag, with his large trade unionist and political following in Aden, was not prepared to do a deal with the Sultans. He demanded general elections. They rejected his proposals out of hand. al Aznag left London empty-handed. The NLF had not been asked to London. They threatened to kill anyone who negotiated with the British. They were still not regarded as a power to be reckoned with. كان الإنجليز وحكومة الاتحاد يرددوا في أجهزة إعلامهم إن هذا العمليات التي تقام في الأرياف ولا يعلنوا عن كل العمليات ولكنهم كانوا يعلنوا عن بعضها من أنها تمردات قبلية. وإنها امتداد لتلك التمردات السابقة التي خضعت في الأخير نتيجة لضربات الاستعمار ولهذا السبب أسرعنا في أن نبدأ بالعمل المسلح في عدن المدينة على اعتبار أنها ستكون تلك الضربات الموجهة في العاصمة تكذيب in the midst of an extinct volcano, Crater, the Arab heart of Aden, became the main battlefield between the NLF and the British authorities. The NLF guerrillas' first targets were the officers in the Arab Special Branch, who had successfully infiltrated their organization. 
The campaign of killing culminated in the murder of the Speaker of the Aden Legislative Council. تمثلت في حضر التجول تمثلت في مطاردة الناس تمثلت في الاعتقالات الواسعة تمثلت في قامة معسكرات متحركة ومعسكرات ثابتة وحديثة داخل المنطقة كلها. In September 1965, a wave of riots and strikes protesting at the British plans for independence under the Federation of Sultans forced the colonial authorities to declare a state of emergency. Direct rule was imposed. The Aden Legislative Council was suspended. The Nationalists had achieved their objective of creating a confrontation. Law and order had practically broken down in Aden, and we felt unless we controlled the thing directly, we'd have anarchy, it's rather like the situation when we imposed direct rule in Northern Ireland. But wasn't it an admission of defeat? Well, it was an admission that the uh, policy which we'd inherited wasn't working, and that was certainly the case. <laughs> The Labour government hoped that a dash of direct rule would force the nationalists and the sultans to come to terms. Dennis Healy toured Britain's overseas bases as economic pressure forced a change of policy. His first target for cuts was Aden. We decided to get out in 66 and we decided to get out because there was no case for staying in Aden unless we needed it as a base for action in the Gulf. Once we decided that we were not going to intervene militarily in the Gulf, there was no case for staying there. Lord Beswick, a junior minister, was sent to Aden to tell the federal rulers that the base was to be closed and they would lose its protection after independence. Well, Lord Beswick came out in 1966 uh, and told us that the British government has decided unilaterally and without any consultation with us, which went against all the understanding and the treaties we had, to pull out of Aden, to, to pull out of Saudi Arabia and uh, liquidate the base. And we sensed from that that they were no longer interested in a proper um, handover of responsibility to uh, the Federation. I felt completely betrayed by them uh, because what they did was uh, contrary to everything we, uh, we were led to believe. Uh, I think they behaved in a most uh, dishonorable way. I don't think we'd betrayed them because we never made them any promises. I think that uh, Duncan Sands as Defence Secretary and Commonwealth Secretary gave them a totally false impression of what Britain might do. The breach of faith is clear. Uh, and uh, I suppose I ought to know better than anybody because I gave the pledge. Uh, in uh, 1964, we had a conference in London at which we had representatives from the whole of the Federation of South Arabia, including Aden. And they said to us that they wanted independence. They'd like it before the end of 1968, uh, but it was no good to them to have independence unless they could have the means of preserving it. And that meant that they must have a defense agreement with Britain under which we would continue to give them protection at any rate for a period after until they were able to look after themselves. With Egyptian forces across the border and growing violence from the nationalists, the British government's decision had opened the door to chaos. In Aden, Arabs saw little point in helping a colonial power on its way out. The battle for succession began. Adeni nationalists like Abdullah al aznag who had hoped with the Labour government's help to reach power through the ballot box, went to Cairo, seeking Nasser's protection. al aznag was now driven to set up a guerrilla movement of his own. It was called Flossi the front for the liberation of occupied South Yemen. The Egyptian government was keen to help and to have an influence over Aden's future. It tried to form a coalition of the two main nationalist groups, getting the NLF to join Flossie. We were supporting uh, only the independence of the country, so that's why we are putting a lot of pressure on 
all of them to come together and have a kind of coalition uh, government. And it's not only that, because we were worried about a civil war in the future. Uh, and Nasser was really thinking that uh, in order to establish peace in the area, there must be some kind of coalition government. And not only that, he thought that we must look to the future. My point of view about a solution in uh, Aden uh, before uh, the British leave is to talk with the nationalists and try to have stable nationalist government, not a puppet government. But the NLF, radicalized by three years of guerrilla fighting, soon fell out with what they called the bourgeois Adeni politicians. The NLF was stronger in the protectorates, and in Aden they undermined Aznag's power with their increasingly effective guerrilla tactics. They could see no reason to share the spoils and rejected Egyptian schemes. Nasser, angered by the Marxist influence in an increasingly independent NLF, gave Flossie his full support. Each guerrilla movement tried to prove to the people that it was the army that was driving out the British. Are we running? So get out of it. This could be one of the biggest battles yet. The British troops are now going in to try and knock out the Flossy regular machine gun posts. That's far from great time. This is probably the biggest single battle that British troops have been involved in with terrorists so far in, in Aden. We don't know what's going on. British troops are over in that direction. And the Russians... Such battles forced the British government to seek talks with those it considered terrorists. It sent a minister, Lord Shackleton, to try. The colonial authorities in Aden strongly opposed the initiative. Naturally, the colonial office didn't like us coming because we were turning everything on its head. And uh, one remembers the remark, classical, I think, of many ex-colonial situations, I will not negotiate with these murderers. But the history of the end of empire is negotiating with whatever you like to call them. Lord Shackleton's was the first British attempt to contact the NLF after three years of fighting. Sir Sam Fall was taken by a go-between to meet NLF representatives in a back street in Crater. I explained that Lord Shackleton had come to Aden in order to negotiate independence and to involve all parties concerned. The NLF were a very important party to this and we would be interested in talking with them and we would of course consider uh, releasing their detainees and uh, taking the ban off their party so that we could discuss things in a reasonable and relaxed atmosphere. But there was just one minor condition that we'd like to make if it were possible we would be very grateful if they would stop killing us and the two representatives roared with laughter and one of them he did like this he said Abu Sami very sorry Abu Sami this is quite impossible but being young naive and foolish I said, but, but why? We come with peace and we want to talk to you. It would be rational if you'd stop killing us. He said, no, you must understand that uh, Flossie constantly accuse us of being the running dogs of the imperialists. And if we, at this moment, were seen to be talking to you, this would simply give credence to their story, that they are the sole representatives of the people of South Arabia, and we are imperialist lackeys. And so, Abu Sami, we're very sorry, but we have got to drive you out of Aden. And we have to be seen to drive you out of Aden. 
When we have reached that stage, then we can negotiate. إذا إنها تشكل القلب وتشكل ال ال منطقة الاتصال ب بالعالم بالعالم بأجمعه. وبدون ذلك ما كان للجبهة القومية أن تحقق نهوضا حقيقيا للعمل العسكري أو السياسي أو الإعلامي ولا أن تحقق انتصارا بهذا المستوى الذي تحقق By mid-1967, British soldiers were risking their lives in a colony they would leave in a matter of months We were sort of, uh, well, sort of the rat in the trap, waiting for them to come out. You, you couldn't go around and just look for them. They weren't in uniform. The only way to catch them is to patrol the streets and hope for them to come to you. Every day you'd have a ground patrol going, you'd have maybe a platoon of, say, nine or ten men going in. They'd patrol the streets. You might get a small crowd demonstrate, and you might go after them and chase them. The crowd would try and draw you into a certain area or run down a certain street where there'd be somebody waiting to ambush, you know. حيث كان هناك يخرج العدد من الأشخاص قد يصلون إلى ثلاثة وقد يصلون إلى خمسة وهناك يجري تدريب كل منهم على حدة أو بشكل ثنائي يعني على شكل اثنين اثنين يجري تدريبهم على المسدس ويجري تدريبهم على استخدام القنبلة اليدوية ويجري تدريبهم على استخدام المتفجرات. It was mainly grenades. That was the favourite thing. Because with a grenade, they could throw it maybe from behind the wall, from a from a building, or bushes, or, or from a crowd even. Is this the one that uh, threw the grenade at Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Well, yes. Tell, tell me exactly what happened now. Well, uh, we're just driving up behind the Land Rover, and this chap drove in front of us. Drove past Mr. Gilbert on the left-hand side, and he chipped the grenade. Tried to get away, so we got in front of him. The NLF became stronger, and the British security forces were blighted in their efforts to catch guerrillas by poor intelligence. Few Arabs would help them. Soon, British frustration gave way to desperate measures. Suspects were rounded up on the streets. They were taken to a barbed wire compound. Hooded informers picked out suspected guerrillas among the detainees. And as official inquiries subsequently confirmed, torture was used. وكنت واحدا من أولئك الذين قد تعرضوا للاعتقال لمدة ثمانية ثمانية أشهر. خلال هذا المعتقل وخلال الفترة التي قضيتها في السجن تعرضت إلى التعذيب النفساني والجسدي الذي تمثل بالضرب والتعذيب بالكهرباء والتعذيب بوسائل عديدة كانت قد تركت آثارا وعاهات لمن دخلوا هذا المعتقل وكنت واحدا من هؤلاء الذين 
The allegations of widespread torture caused an international scandal. This was yet another embarrassment for the British Labour government. By 1967, the decision had been taken by the British government to leave. Uh, there was no intention on their part to reverse or change that decision. There might be limited possibilities in timing, but the decision was to go. So the policy was how to get out uh, the armed forces and the civilian community without a bloodbath and if possible, handing over to some practicable successor government. By the end, of course, any practicable successor government. As Britain prepared to pull out, the battle for succession between Flossie and the NLF intensified. With Egyptian help, the Flossie leadership under the Labour Party's former friend, Abdullah al aznag now set out to destroy the NLF. Is Flossie the only organization responsible for the present wave of terrorism in Aden? Flossie is the uh, only uh, leading organization that, uh, that's responsible for the armed resistance of our people. I see there has been a lot of talk about a rival organization called the NLF, which is also claiming attacks. Is there any truth in this? NLF is a mere uh, label used by the uh, federal and the British administration in Aden to suggest confusion about the uh, fight and struggle of our people for independence. Uh, that is to say that they would like to suggest uh, uh, the existence of more than one front. But the truth is that there is only Flossie and nothing but Flossie. Despite Aznag's protestations, the Sultans were more worried about the NLF. They pinned all their hopes for the future on the Federal Armed Forces. They were much encouraged when the Labour government gave military aid in the summer of 1967 to modernise them. Both the NLF and Flossie were secretly recruiting members in the forces. To ensure their loyalty, the Sultans promoted pro-Federation officers. The move backfired. The event that finally destroyed what remained of the Sultan's power came on June the 20th, 1967. A mutiny broke out in the Federal Army ranks, spreading to this barracks in Crater, where the NLF agent Abdul Razak Shaif, now released from prison, was instigating an uprising. A British army patrol of two Land Rovers carrying nine soldiers approached the barracks along this road. Fusilier John Storey was in the second vehicle. The NLF-led police began shooting from the windows of this barracks. It happened so fast. It was so devastating. The Land Rover in front stopped. Uh, I got shot across the side. I got winged across the side. All I wanted to do was get out. I felt caged in. The Land Rover slowed down. I jumped out. The Land Rover continued on for another 50, 60 feet and crashed into the wall of the police barracks. I ran past uh, the corporal in our Land Rover. And he was just lying there still, covered his chest was just a mass of blood with holes in. And the two officers had been shot on fire. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't see the, the, other, the other men, maybe they were scattered around the ground. I got shot through the arm. There was no cover whatsoever, getting shot from both sides. Maybe by a hundred or so, uh, police and terrorists. Had machine guns, rifles, pistols. Um, I look around. I see in the fl one of the blocks of flats had a doorway open. I, uh, I ran, zigzagged across the road. The pavement, the road, everything was all jumping and zigzagging. It was like all exploding, all the concrete was exploding around me. But I managed to make it into the blocks of flats. John Sorey hid in this block of flats and held an Arab family hostage at gunpoint for three hours. He escaped by jumping out of a window. This painting in an Aden museum records the events of the 20th of June, 1967 now an historic date in the nationalist calendar. John Storey was the only survivor of this ambush. 
on the 20th of June, 22 soldiers were killed. They are buried here at Silent Valley near Aden. Unfortunately, um, events overtook us, uh, but it was not late if to, to put things right had we been uh, wholly supported by the British government. But because the, our own army believed that the British government were no longer behind the Federation, and so they were divided, they were looking elsewhere for future governments. But, uh, they were doing it because they knew that the Labour government no longer, and the High Commissioner Trevelyan was no longer behind the federal government. The June the 20th shootings led the British troops to withdraw from Crater. The NLF took over, a triumph that resounded throughout the Arab world. The British army surrounded Crater, cutting off the supplies of electricity and water. Young British officers like Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders demanded an immediate attack on Crater to avenge their dead comrades. A plan for a limited operation was finally agreed. And 13 days after the June the 20th ambush, the Highlanders retook Crater at dawn without incident. Colonel Mitchell became an overnight folk hero and was thereafter known to the readers of British popular newspapers as Mad Mitch. What were the reasons for retaking Crater? It has come as a great surprise. Well, uh, you know, purely as a soldier, the, the reasons were that the whole prestige of the army depended on going back in, obviously. You know, we were thrown out, truth be known, and uh, we had to go back in. I propose to stay here, if I'm allowed to, with the battalion for as long as, uh, you know, the British are in Crater. And, uh, you know, I've just told them we're a very mean lot. I mean, it's, uh, we'll be very fair, you know. But uh, if anyone starts any trouble, they'll just get their head blown off. Uh, they'll get the message in time, you know. This, uh, this Glengarry helps a bit, you know. And the bagpipes help. And the well. bagpipes, yes. And, and one or two other things. <laughs> the Army High Command overruled Mitchell. They were determined to avoid a bloodbath. Colonel Mitchell, for reasons of his own, wished to cut a dash with the Argyle and Southern Highlanders in Crater. There were six other battalions in Aden, all of whom were doing an equally good job and could have sorted the Arabs out too. But they understood that the object was not to sort the Arabs out, but to leave as peacefully as possible when the time came. So I stopped Colonel Mitchell and made him do what everybody else was doing, keep the place as quiet as possible. For the Federation, the mutiny of its own forces was the beginning of the end. The hour of the Sultans had passed. The NLF stood poised to grab control. The first of the Sultans fell only 24 hours after the June the 20th ambush. On the top of the hill, the Emir of Dala was besieged. Below, his subjects were in arms. قلنا نتكلم على معه يعني على اساس يسلم نفسه وخرج ظهر من الشباط حق الطاقه وتنحى عن الاماره الشرط الاول والشرط الثاني التزم ان يرفع الضابط سياسي فورا. One by one the Sultans fell during the summer of 1967 as British troops pulled back to Aden to prepare for the final withdrawal. In the countryside there was only one voice. In Aden, too, the struggle was to be one-sided. Egypt, defeated by Israel in the Six-Day War, was no longer able to give Flossie the military backing on which it had depended. I think that Flossie never had uh, a sufficient uh, following in 
the Federation as a whole. They had a certain trade union based following in Aden, based largely upon the port, but up country they had very little following, and as it became clear towards the end, they had no strength at all in the armed forces. <laughs> British soldiers were under strict orders to take no chances as the battle between Flossie and the NLF raged through the autumn. Our orders, uh, certainly as, as we came towards the end, were to play the, the whole thing as low-key as possible. And the NLF and Flossie were, were battling it out. And uh, instances we'd see, for example, from our observation positions would be... Um, uniformed men in some instances and non-uniformed in others going to the back doors of houses be two or three shots and they'd run out again and when we'd investigate of course we'd find a body there now this is a situation which uh, we'd been told we shouldn't interfere in at all and it was peculiar to the last days of Aden which um, our government wanted us to come out uh, as quietly as possible one has to remember that this withdrawal from Aden was in no circumstances a war it was a withdrawal of our presence from a place we've been in for many years. There was therefore, as it was not a war, no conceivable justification for having one young man in the British Armed Forces wounded or killed more than absolutely 100% necessary. How could one, and one was constantly thinking of their families as one usually is, could one possibly justify to a mother in, say, Yorkshire, that her son, Private Jones, had been killed because of inter-Arab fighting in a place which we were leaving a few weeks later, or even a few days later? And that thought was always in my mind. In the last six months, 30,000 troops pulled out, leaving a rear guard around the British airbase. The High Command was worried that the victorious NLF would carry out its threat to launch a final assault. Off Aden, a task force of 24 ships stood ready to perform a quick rescue. For the NLF, the moment of victory was near. Their colonial enemies were leaving, and their nationalist rivals, Flossie, were defeated in Aden. NLF leader Katana Shabi summoned journalists to Zinjiba, a small town near Aden, to announce his conditions. That they will give our people their full independence. That is the first point. Second point, that they realize that the NLF is the true representative of uh, our people. Third point is that Britain is ready to hand over full authority to NLF. And then, if I am selected by the NLF command to meet any British uh, uh, authority, or uh, I am ready to do that. In November, in Geneva, only days before the British withdrawal, the former guerrilla leader, Ashabi, was recognized by Britain as the future head of an independent government. The High Commissioner, Sir Humphrey Trevelyan, took the final salute from the deck of HMS Intrepid. In Aden, there were no fanfares and no formal handover of power. Regimental flags were lowered. At quarter to two, the helicopters lifted the final 330 men from about 10 uh, positions around the perimeter of Aden. Colonel Di Morgan was the last British soldier out of Aden. He left at three o'clock on the afternoon of the 29th of November, 1967. As I circled the positions which my unit had been occupying for the last day to ensure that everything had been picked up safely and there was nobody left behind, I had a feeling of sadness that I was um, turning out across the Aden Bay to back to Albion, that I was the last man and we were leaving Aden after a British, British presence had been there for 128 years. It was all very sad.
In the streets of Aden and all over the country, there was jubilation. The 128 years of the British Raj, which started with Captain Haynes, had ended. Aden was the colony that went over to the other side. The Federation of South Arabia became the People's Republic of Yemen, a Marxist state and an ally of the Soviet Union. Next week, Archbishop Makarios, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Cyprus, is seen also as the founder of Killer Gangs when End of Empire returns at 8.25. And remember, an impressive book of this series is available from bookshops and the ABC shop in your capital city. Stay with us now for the latest news, followed by our Sunday stereo special, Mozart in Delphi.